Is it better to bottle pasteurize or keg your cider? Why not both? I just said, yes, man. Several years ago, I made a video on how to make sweet, sparkling hard cider. In that video, I showed you how to pasteurize your cider bottles, but the temps were a little too high and it's just not as safe of a process as it could be. So in this video, I'm gonna show you two methods to finish off your cider that are safer and just way better. There's a little bit of a, a trick to making sweet sparkling cider. Normally when you bottle something like beer or cider and you want it to be carbonated, you have to put a little bit of sugar in each bottle or mix in a larger amount of sugar with the total volume that you're gonna bottle. And that's gonna give the yeast that's resident in your cider or beer just enough food to produce some carbon dioxide tiny bit of alcohol too, but mostly we're after the carbon dioxide. So what the yeast does is within each bottle, it'll eat all that sugar that you just put in and it'll carbonate your bottles for you. Now that's great if you want a non-sweet cider, a dry cider, but if you want a sweet cider, it's a little trickier because at some point you have to tell those yeast to stop working so that they don't eat up all your sugar that's gonna give you a little sweetness. Some people will use uh, lactose sugar or artificial sweeteners because the yeast don't eat those. That way you just put in your priming sugar or the carbonating sugar and your alternative sweetener that the yeast don't eat and that way you'll get some sweetness. But one, I'm lactose intolerant and two, my wife is allergic to a lot of artificial sweeteners and I don't really like the taste. So when I make a sweet hard cider, I wanna do it with sugar, usually with uh, apple juice concentrate. And since you're just putting straight sugar into the bottles in the form of that apple juice concentrate, you have to at some point stop the yeast from working so they don't eat up all the rest of your sugar. The easiest way to do that is to pasteurize your bottles. Basically you heat them up to a certain temperature for a certain period of time and that kills off all the yeast and leaves you with some residual sugar in your bottles. So you have both carbonation and sweetness. And finding that balance is a little tricky as well. But if you've seen my other video, you know that we've already got a solution for that. We're gonna get to that in just a second. Your other option, if you want a sweet sparkling cider, is to keg it. Now I am using a small five liter keg, but a lot of people will just do a five gallon keg. They'll do the whole batch in the keg. I'm not set up to do that. This is what I'm set up to do, this little mini keg. So let's go ahead and dive in and show you how to do it. The first thing that we need to make sweet sparkling cider is some apple cider. I made some called an apple mash cider where I actually fermented all of the apple pulp and the juice together in a previous video. I'm gonna go ahead and put that right up here if you wanna try that out. But this method will work for any hard cider. So once the cider is completely fermented and it's had a chance to mature and drop clear over about a month or two, let's move on to bottling and kegging. Oh, uh, one thing is I'm gonna make a juice concentrate. If I can't find it in the store, uh, here in the US it comes in little 12 ounce containers, but I understand that that is actually quite difficult to find in other parts of the world. So there's an easy thing to do. You just make it. And the reason why I want you to try making the juice concentrate instead of using like plain sugar is one, you get a lot more flavor. Two, it's a good standardized measurement that seems to work every single time I've bottled cider. So here's all you need to do. You take 48 ounces of juice, throw that into a pot and boil it down by three fourths until you have only 12 ounces. And then cool that down and now you have juice concentrate. You don't have to use apple juice concentrate. You can use uh, an appropriate amount of sugar. Just look for a priming calculator online. I use the apple juice concentrate because I really like the fact that one can of concentrate or 12 ounces of concentrate ends up perfectly carbonating and sweetening one gallon of cider or roughly four liters. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that all of our bottles and our keg and all the parts that we're gonna use to transfer the cider are clean and sanitized. I'm using Star Sand Sanitizer because it's a no rinse sanitizer, so you just put it on and go. I'm gonna add half a can or six ounces of my apple juice concentrate to my keg and then fill it the rest of the way with my cider. I have four gallons of cider left, so I'm gonna add four cans of concentrate to my bottling bucket and then drain the cider into the bucket to mix slowly. 
Make sure that the cider doesn't splash so that you don't oxygenate the cider. Once the cider and apple juice concentrate are in the bottling bucket, it's time to bottle. I'm just using a regular bottling wand. I'm also filling up two sanitized soda bottles. I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so now the bottles are filled. They're all capped off. These soda bottles are critical. The reason being, we need to know when the carbonation is done so that we know when to pasteurize. And a soda bottle is perfect because it's got squishy sides. And when it's fully carbonated, it's gonna be like a brand new unopened soda. It's basically hard as a rock. So let your cider bottle sit in the exact same place that you're putting this one at room temperature for four to seven days. And give this a squeeze every day. And when it's hard as a rock, then your bottles are fully carbonated and it's time to pasteurize. Do not wait past this getting nice and firm. The best advice I can give you to make sure that your bottles are fully carbonated and not slightly under carbonated is to squeeze your test bottle right next to a full unopened soda of the exact same type of bottle so that when they are the exact same firmness, you know you're ready. I put a Camden tablet in my keg. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you also need potassium sorbate to add in there as another stopgap to make sure that the yeast doesn't go any further. Since I don't have any potassium sorbate, I was a little concerned that the Camden tablet wasn't gonna be enough to completely stop the activity. So I got to thinking, well, I'm gonna pasteurize my bottles. This keg is pretty small. Can't I just pasteurize the keg too? Yes, yes you can. So that leads me to this uh, very unfortunate looking device, the Ass Blaster 5 million. <laughs> it's not really. The Ass Blaster 5 million looks completely different. This is actually a uh, sous vide cooker. It's got a little, see if you can see it in there, little heater coil and a little impeller pump. You stick this down into a water bath and use it to cook meats and stuff that's sealed in like a Ziploc bag or a, a vacuum bag. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting cooking process, but the, the cool thing is that this is really, really, really handy for when you need to pasteurize things. For the keg, I just put it into a big pot of water, set my sous vide cooker to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, this much in Celsius, and let it run for about two hours. The first hour was just to bring it up to temperature, and the next hour was to hold that temperature in order to kill all the yeast. And we're basically gonna do the exact same thing with the bottles once they're carbonated. But while those are carbonating, we need to get this keg carbonated too. So let's uh, talk about today's sponsor, Vivor. So Vivor sent me this uh, mini keg to try out, and honestly, it's really cool. It is now full of my cider, it's been camdened, uh, and then it's been sous vide, it's ready to go, but we gotta carbonate it. And luckily this thing comes with a keg tap. And uh, so let's go ahead and get this thing together. You got your main tap here, and this is gonna be your regulator and gas input. Just screw it together like that. And then we're gonna put it on the keg. The carbonating instructions that uh, I'm gonna give you now, I got from one of my viewers, Dennis, Thank you very much, brother. He's been using one of these for his cider for a little while now and has come up with a pretty standard method for carbonating your cider. So we're gonna go through that in just a second. Let me get this attached. Got a little post in there. You're gonna hook up your hose. Make sure you sanitize all your pieces. And what I did is I took my uh, four liter keg, filled that with some sanitizer and water, pressurized it, and then shook that up, and then just opened the tap and let the, uh, let the sanitizer run out. I'm gonna put a link for this keg from Vivor down in the video description. If you're gonna pick one up, make sure that you use my coupon code. I'm gonna put that right here and also next to the link. So if you use that coupon code, you're gonna get a 5% discount on the keg. And the only other thing you need to get is these uh, CO2 cartridges. And these are not the same kind that you would use in a BB gun or a paintball gun or anything like that. Those are smooth tip and also they are not food grade. So there may be lubricants and other kinds of things in there. If you have threaded CO2 cartridges that are not specifically food grade, don't use them. I'm gonna put an Amazon link for these guys down in the video description. So you wanna make sure that your regulator is turned all the way off.
and then we're going to pressurize it up to about 30 pounds. Pro tip, make sure the tap is closed when you uh, turn on the regulator. That's this handle here pushed all the way back. Otherwise you're going to waste your cider like a dumbass. I make mistakes so that you don't have to. All right, so let's try that again. All right, so now that we have this thing pressurized, about 30 PSI or two bar, you want to, uh, every once in a while when you walk by it, give it a shake. And if you want to, you can stick it in the fridge or if it's cold enough, stick it outside. According to Dennis, it's gonna take a day or two for that CO2 to get fully absorbed into the cider. Cold helps it absorb in there and it also helps it stay when you're ready to actually tap it. We're gonna let this sit while the rest of the bottles continue carbonating. And when this is hard like a bullet, then we'll, uh, we'll try both of them. See you in a couple days. Hurry up, I'm thirsty. All right, so carbonation is done. And as you can see, this thing is hard as a rock. And so now we need to pasteurize. So I've got everything set up in here. I'm using an ice chest so I have a long channel because one of the things you wanna avoid with these guys is getting your bottles too close to that heating element. If it's too close, then it can overheat your bottles and they can explode. That happened to me twice. So if you can leave about a foot of space or roughly 30 centimeters in between your heating element and your bottles, that's gonna do a lot better for you. And over here, you'll notice that I have a bottle that's open. Now this just has plain water in it. And we toss our thermometer in there so that when we hit our temperature over here, we can double check and make sure that the liquid inside the bottles is the same temperature. And once those two thermometers are the same, that's when we start our timer. Make sure that you figure out where the level is inside your bottles and get your water up above that. If you leave some cider space up above the top level of your water, you can have some yeast that may survive clinging to the glass up in the top. So make sure that you get at least as high as the level of the liquid in your bottles. I've got this thing set for 120. Let it sit at 120 for 20 minutes. And that's gonna kind of preheat these bottles and uh, it's gonna reduce the potential bottle shock so that you don't have as many problems with breakage. And then once you've hit 120 degrees of your water temperature for 20 minutes, go ahead and bump it up to 140 and let it sit for about 45 minutes. After that, you can either leave the bottles in there to cool slowly with the water or you can take them out and put them on the countertop. Either way, the yeast are dead. And you can do all of your batches one after the other and get your sink full with nice hot water, put all your bottles in there so that they can do that preheating process in the sink. And then when it's time for these bottles to come out, you can take those and pop them in and give them 45 minutes and they should be good. I'll see you in a couple hours. All right, so our bottles are pasteurized, our keg is carbonated, and we're ready to go. But I wanna answer a couple of questions that I get all the time before we get going. Uh, one is, do I need to pasteurize my bottles? No, there's only certain circumstances when you need to do that. And that would be if you wanna store them at room temperature or if they're going to leave your possession, as in you're giving some as a gift because it doesn't matter if you tell your friend, hey, these need to go straight in the fridge as soon as you get home. They might forget and they'll sit in their hot car, in their hot garage. It's, uh, it's not super great to give your friends glass grenades. So if you're gonna give stuff away, make sure it's pasteurized. If not, then just stick it in the fridge because the cold temperatures will put the yeast into dormancy. It doesn't kill the yeast, even freezing doesn't really kill yeast, but it'll put it into dormancy. Basically it goes to sleep and the yeast will stop digesting the sugar and uh, turning it into carbon dioxide and alcohol, but only to a point. So if you put your bottles in the fridge and three months later you go to open one because you left it in the back of the fridge and forgot about it, it's probably gonna be overcarbonated because that activity is still happening just at a very, very minuscule level. So keep that in mind. If you don't pasteurize, there's a clock on all this stuff depending on the temperature that it is. So I, I've used this uh, sous vide machine, I think four times now, 
and I really like it. Again, if you want to get one, Amazon link down in the video description, but it doesn't really matter the brand as long as you get one that has uh, enough power, this one's a thousand watts, and that it's rated to handle like 15 to 20 liters of water, because it's, it's a large volume of water that you need to be circulating and heating. So, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that go into bottle pasteurization, and there is always, even with the sous vide method, there's always some risk that you're gonna have a bottle bomb. So be careful, pay attention, and protect yourself. If you have kids or animals, keep them out of the kitchen because you never know if there's a micro crack in one of your bottles that you just didn't see. So knowing all of that, I'm forced to admit that kegging the cider is becoming a much more desirable option for me. Something like this, where you just pour the cider in, it's small enough that you can actually pasteurize the container of cider and, you know, all the parts just screw on and you're using the this much co2 that you can buy on amazon it's pretty attractive to me so let's go ahead and taste these two ciders and uh, see if they differ see how they came out and uh, find out if i messed this up but before i do that i just want to thank all of my patreon supporters all of you folks down here thank you so much for uh, sticking with me for supporting this channel and for constantly giving me feedback and ideas I could not do this without you guys, and you are still keeping my lights on. Thank you so much. So. Oh. <laughs> so that one was a little overcarved. Toss the bail off. The good news is the bottle didn't break and we didn't have a gusher. But uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a little startling. That brings me to my next safety tip. Make sure that you give these guys a little bit of a squeeze to bring these two points close together before you hook them into the little divots on the neck of the bottle. That's gonna make sure that what just happened doesn't happen. If you ever put your bottles in the dishwasher to sterilize them after you're done brewing, the metal can relax a little bit and just through use, the metal can relax a little bit. So double check these before you bottle. Just take them off, give them a squeeze and snap them back on. After all that excitement, I need a drink. That's good. That's where I want it. A little bit sweet, nice and tart, and a crazy amount of apple flavor. That big punch of apple flavor, it's like apple skins, and it's making my mouth water. I did it once from fresh pressed cider that I got from a friend uh, years ago, and I remember that cider very clearly, and it did not give me this puckery, mouth-watery, fresh sliced apple flavor. And I really do attribute that amount of flavor, that kick, to leaving the stems and the seeds and the skins in the cider while it was fermenting. So if you haven't seen that video, definitely go and check it out up here. <sighs> yeah. That came out exactly the way I wanted it to. Hopefully I did the, uh, the cider and the Vivor correct too. So one of these canisters will pressurize your cider, but there's usually not enough gas left in it to serve an entire keg. So if you go anywhere with your cider, make sure you bring another one. And just keep in mind, you don't serve at the same pressure that you carbonate. So if you're carbonating at 25 to 30 PSI, you don't serve it that hard because <laughs> you're gonna get really foamy cider. Uh, so what you need to do, first thing, is you're going to make sure that your pressure valve is turned all the way off. Then your little ring here, you're going to pull that to let all the excess pressure out before you start serving. And then we're just going to change out our CO2 cartridge. And now we're going to open the valve and bring it up to about 5 to 7 PSI. There we go. I almost forgot. Uh, when you're done serving, turn your pressure back up to 25 to 30 PSI to maintain that level of carbonation. So now that we're set at five to seven PSI, uh, make sure that when you are serving, open the valve all the way so that you don't end up getting a foamy pour. So let's give it a shot.
that's really good. It's not as overcarved as the uh, pasteurized bottle that I did, but it's still got some very nice carbonation to it. And the flavor is really good. Ugh. That came out so good. So if you'd rather not go through the hassles of bottle pasteurization, the different stages that you have to go through, and the fact that there is always a bottle bomb risk, then just go to a keg. If you want to check out one of these, I'm going to put a link down in the video description and make sure you use the coupon code that goes with it so you can get a 5% discount. Everything that I've tried out from Vivor so far has been excellent and this is no exception. It's really well made, it's very sturdy, and it's exactly what it's supposed to be. All right, so that is it. If you enjoyed the video, if you learned anything, do me a favor and hit the like button because it really helps out the channel. If you want to see what kind of crazy shit I'm going to get up to next time, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon right next to it so that you can get notified when I post new content. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions on uh, kegging or bottle pasteurization, go ahead and leave those down in the comments section down below. All right, thanks for watching. Talk at you later. Don't mind if I do.